Well, Liz here with Smart Business Moves, and Tom is not here as my co-host today, but you know who is here? An amazing guest. We have Bruce Vance. Hey, Bruce. Hi there. Ah, so glad that you could join us here today, Bruce, and spend an hour uh, helping our our little group of people that follow us figure out kind of where we're going. It's kind of a scary time. I mean, for a lot of people, it feels not as scary because, okay, we're at least past the big pandemic piece, but there's more stuff coming down the pike. There are more changes coming, right? There are going to be a lot of changes, I think, coming, and it's it's not going to be easy. <clears throat> You know, we in, in cleaning, we went along pretty much the same thing for about 2,800 years. <laughs> uh, we have actually found uh, residues of, of soap-like compounds that are 2,800 years old. Are you kidding me? Are you no. exaggerating? <clears throat> no. That was just wow. in clean facts. Wow. Um, and then in the 50s, we had the first great uh, revolution in cleaning. Okay. We got the detergents. The, okay, and those wait. Came, See, see, this is why we brought you on here, Bruce, because you're going to have all the facts and all the details. All right. So for everybody, first, before we jump right into it all, I, I'd like to at least have Bruce introduce himself. Uh, I know that most of you probably know who Bruce is, why he's the expert, why we turn to him when we want to find out about cleaning. Nobody knows more about actual cleaning than Bruce Vance. Oh, look at this. Tom's coming on here. We'll okay, let him great. come on in a second. But while he's figuring out how to get in here, if you can, <laughs> Bruce, why don't you go ahead and tell us about yourself? Introduce yourself. Tell, tell our audience who you are and why we look to you so strongly as the leader. Okay. Uh let me see if I can get straight in here. Hey, Tom. Uh, okay, let's hey, guys. Tom. Sorry, I'm late. No, no worries. We, we told people you might not even be able to make it. So good on you. Look how fast you got here. Um, Great. The uh, I'm Bruce Vance. I have been in the cleaning industry. Well, we've been in town and country cleaning from uh, for 32 years, and I've been around, knocking around the cleaning industry a little bit before that and carpet cleaning working for some carpet cleaning companies, probably close to 40 years in this industry. Um, I, was in, I was involved in getting the first certification, international certification set up. I was the, the uh, te technical advisory chairman after David Kaiser, who deserves a lot of credit for that too. And I don't want to take away from it. Um, and... Uh, we figure that in that class, we have now had representatives for, from about 500 companies oh, in uh, wow. 10 countries and at least five continents. All right. And that's the HCT program that you're talking about. That's the about. HCT program. That's the technician program. So for those of you that haven't heard about it yet, you can find out more about it um, through ISSA, ARCC. Uh, all right, go ahead, go, go on. So five, you know. five continents, wait a minute. So I'm assuming Antarctica is one of the two that didn't make the cut. What's the other one? Um, Leave it to Tom to ask the hard questions. I'm trying to think. Maybe it was Africa. Okay. Right. As okay. far as I know, we didn't have anyone from Africa. Yet. Yeah, Bruce. We, we will fix that. We had, we had one gal who actually, when we were doing a live class in Raleigh, who actually had come from Mumbai oh, wow. for the class. That's that's a track right there. She said uh, she looked on, uh, looked on the internet and said there was no other class like it in the world. That's so true. probably true. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but anyway, so that's kind of my background and I'm still, I finally am off of the tack chair, although they've put me back on as a uh, vice chair. When you uh, say tack chair, you know, explain what that is. I mean, this just isn't like a, a couple of people getting together in their basement over, you know, a 12 pack of beer and coming up with a bunch of. No, the, the IICRC is the largest certifying body in the world for the cleaning and restoration industry. They are uh, American National Standards uh, Institute approved for their standards. They have very strict standards on how you do these uh, these classes and these uh, courses. Uh, these are not something a couple people, as Tom said, sat in their basement and did it. We had representatives, have representatives from chemical manufacturers, from um, 
equipment manufacturers. We get input from the uh, um, uh, flooring manufacturers. We have a lot, and of course, the cleaning industry itself. So it's no one person's idea, and it's what we have to do to um, verify each question is intense. And uh, Tom was involved in the first one, run through on this, so he has some concept of what I'm talking and, about. And this consensus built among industry experts, Liz, you were uh, participated in, in normalizing the answers to the questions. And a lot of it gets kind of nerdy, but it took years to get the yeah. final product. Yeah. I remember Liz coming off of one of the uh, meetings there and going, these people are intense. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I remember that too. Was it only one meeting that I said that? No, I don't think so. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a very serious thing. But as we're moving forward, I think we the the science is becoming more important. Yeah. We, as I was saying, we tell us we, why. Why do you think that, Bruce? Well, when we went through the pandemic, yeah. the pandemic changed a lot. Um, a lot of the trends that were starting got sidetracked. Uh, a lot of the thought on how to do things uh, turned out to be very wrong where, where we started. Um, we, you know, we had people running around with uh, uh, electrostatic sprayers uh, spraying disinfectant on everything in the house. And then we found out that the fomite transmission is very minimal. Uh, fomite being from a, a uh, contaminated surface. And what I, I always like to remind people that disinfectants are regulated by the EPA as pesticides. So would you feel comfortable if I said, I'm going to make you healthy by spraying pesticide all over your house? For no, for no good reason, for no benefit. For no benefit. And in a home. Actually, even if it was for a good reason, I'm still not in. It still doesn't sound good, right? Well, no. it, you know, it depends what you're, you're doing, though. I mean, there's a lot of medical treatments that are, you know, like chemo and stuff like that. It's kind of the same thing. But, yeah. you know, the cure, yeah. it, it's, it's worth worth the trade off. Yeah. When they were when they were thinking that it was transmitted through surfaces, through fomites, then the thinking was. It's worth the trade-off, but yeah. if there's no efficacy, then you're just poisoning yourself for no good reason. Probably in home, there was even if it had been fomite transmission. True. It's you're, you're using a, a bazooka to uh, do a job you could do with a uh, much a lighter gun, as it were. But, but even multifamily or you know common area. If spray. you were sitting, for instance, if we had a uh, we do several sororities, and uh, we didn't need it there but if we had had say a norovirus outbreak there we would definitely have used that in the uh, common rooms and and especially in the dining room and such because mm -hmm. first of all it's not really only effective on a hard non-porous surface um i know they show it's being sprayed on all kinds of things Carpets, but uh, couches yeah, right. yeah. yeah and depending on what you're using but just looking at disinfection yeah. uh, because this was a big deal first of all the fogging they talked about epa said uh-uh fogging really doesn't work because you can't control what the dosage on a surface is and how long it stays wet okay Makes you've sense. got you've got to um in order to actually disinfect the surface it has to be clean to start with so you'll notice that uh, um, CDC kept saying clean first, yeah. then apply your disinfectant. And then depending on what you're trying to kill or inactivate in the case of a virus, how long are you, do you have to keep it wet? Be and one of the issues we've been, we were coming out of uh, the mm -mm. Uh, pandemic with is a concern over antimicrobial resistance because if you look at the hierarchy of, of how you uh, inactivate or kill, the easiest thing to inactivate is the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So on many of these disinfectants, if, uh, it was saying one minute, one minute for coronavirus, 
uh, two and a half minutes for, uh, say, HIV virus, five minutes for gram negative, I mean, gram positive, and 10 minutes for gram negative. So if you were spraying this and wiping it up after a minute, you were exposing the gram positive, gram negative, and they were kind of going, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> but you weren't keeping it on right. long enough to you're, do a you're, kill. You're getting them drunk, but they sober up the next day stronger than they were before. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it, yes. And so we're seeing that there's, and this is still somewhat controversial in the industry, but we're seeing that um, there's question about how effective are quaternary ammonias, which are our basic if you go out on a grocery store, that's what 90% of your disinfectants well, are. That's the staple. That's the go-to, isn't it? <clears throat> and they're beginning to, but if you've, I don't know if you guys noticed at uh, ISSA, that nobody in the last two years has shown a new qu quaternary ammonia. All the new uh, disinfectants have been either uh, hydrochloric acid or it have been. Um, you mean hyperchlorous? Hyperchlorous, yeah. Yeah. What did you or, say? It like that? Or uh, they I, have. I thought you said hydrochloric. It was like, no, I don't know. Hy no, hypochlorous. Not, hypochlorous. Not to be confused. Two different no, things. No, no, please don't confuse those. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and, or they've been hydrogen peroxide. Right. And those all work by basically burning what they're trying to get, their, their oxidation uh, uh, reaction, which is it's a little harder to get away from uh, to become immune to burning. Okay, before we move on further and go deeper and down this, uh, I'm going to ask you to just take us back because, Bruce, you're right. When everything was coming out, one of the main things that we heard was you have to clean the surface first and then disinfect. Right. What's clean mean? What's clean mean? Yeah, because, you know, you hear, you hear clean and people are like, well, I am cleaning it. I'm using a disinfectant. That's how I'm cleaning it. Right? Yes. So, that is a uh, is the sixty four thousand dollar question, and one well, that there is. I know Siri is beginning to start a series on trying to figure out how to measure clean. Mm, interesting. Because okay. you know, how do we know what something is clean? Yeah. Cleaning basically is removing soil. If you're just going to go to a very basic dis uh, definition, okay. as opposed to disinfecting, which is actually killing whatever is left. Okay. Now, we have done studies, and I know Tom has done studies, and we have shown that just using a high-quality microfiber and plain water or uh, deionized water, we can achieve uh, readings on an uh, uh, ATP meter that are f superior to using a uh, disinfecting scrub cloth. In fact, we've got one on our website where we uh, uh, had a desk that was 1500 uh, on the ATP meter. We uh, cleaned it with a Lysol disinfecting scrub uh, cloth and got it, got one side of that down to uh, 350, cleaned the other side with a high quality microfiber, hospital grade microfiber and deionized water and got it to 50. Wow. What where, are those where, numbers? 350, 50? What are those numbers? Okay. Let's um, back up a little bit. What is uh, ATP? What's an ATP <laughs> what, you know, what in the world are we talking about? Yeah, okay. Let's the, this gets this time. gets ahead, but this is one of the things that we're, as we are talking about, where, where are things going? How okay. do we how do we measure? How do we start figuring out what is clean? Yeah, good. Um, the ATP meter, uh, ATP is adenosine triphosphate. Um uh, and it is the energy molecule in all living things. So an ATP meter basically measures the organic load on a surface. It does not tell us whether it's living or dead. Okay. But it gives us an idea of what's there and how effective we have been in, in removing it. Okay. On the meter that we use. So uh, hold on. I have a question real quick. So if, if is it possible to have organic matter on a surface that is dead or inactive and so it doesn't show up on a measurement or it would show up on a measure measurement it would okay so if you have a lot of bacteria there it's going to have a high reading okay. if you just cut up a tomato there you're going to have a high reading okay um in general on the scale on that particular meter 
anything uh, 30 and under would be good for a commercial kitchen. Okay. 70 or under, that's the meter. Tom has one right there and he's showing us. And they have swabs that look a little bit, look kind of like this, and it looks like a big Q-tip, and you do a four by four area and put it in there, and it gives you a number. Right. 70 would be good for your kitchen, 120, okay for the rest of the house. 200, let's clean it. 500 is pretty filthy. So, like my phone, when my phone had a reading of 370, I should be really scared about putting it on my face. Uh, you probably want to clean it occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Because again, your face oil will pick up, will be picked up on that. Yeah. I'm sure that that's at least a, a big chunk of mine. And I speak into my phone, so I'm constantly spitting onto it. So I'm yeah. sure that's, hey, Penny, good to see you. I'm Charming. sure that's at least a good chunk of it there. But we, you know, we're talking about what is clean. How do we know something's clean? Okay. Well, the, what we have always done is we look at it. We, it looks clean. Okay. It's, uh, ah, you know, feels clean. Okay. Ah, smells clean. Now, one of the pro there's some problems with that. We can't see uh, allergens. We can't see micro uh, bacteria, micro uh, organisms. And many of the smells that we consider clean actually work against us. <clears throat> you know, you have people who go out and go, oh, I, I love it. I can smell the chlorine bleach. I know that it's clean. Right. Um, I know what clean is. My grandmother taught me how to clean, and my bathroom is supposed to smell like a pine tree. My kitchen is supposed to smell like a lemon. Right. Absolutely. Now, you notice, though, that when a, uh, a uh, uh, tanker of chlorine gas uh, uh, falls over and breaks open, that they run around and say, everybody come out and smell how clean it is? <laughs> yeah, not they, so they, 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 they get them out of there because yeah. it's, it's dangerous. Um, the lemon scent is uh, laminine. Laminine, they have, to, you see, they suddenly start doing a lot of testing of air quality after and during the pandemic, stuff they hadn't done before. And they found out that the lam, uh, laminine, which is the, your lemon scent, combines with the uh, uh, ozone in the air to form formaldehyde. Oh, I did not know that. What they discovered, I was uh, on a, a webinar in which uh, some people who were doing this research were talking about it, is that the terpenes, which are your smell molecules in your essential oils, are extremely active, chemically active. And so they get up in the air and then they start reacting with whatever's there. And so you get some very interesting things that are developing from that. So they may not be quite as safe as we thought they were. Okay. that's So that's taking us a little bit closer to why things are changing, why we should be looking for things are going to be different. <clears throat> things There are going to be a lo lot of things. If you went right before the, as I say, we are in the, we had the one big uh, revolution of cleaning in the 50s when they yeah. came in with uh, disinfectants. Uh, not disinfectants, but uh, detergents. We've started another one when, with the microfibers, with the green cleaning, and, and trying to figure out what is green, what's not green, and you know how we can get things that are uh, better and better to from a green point of view. And as we went, before the uh, pandemic, we had a very interesting interplay between the people who were doing engineered water of one form or another and the chemical companies. <laughs> chemical companies weren't real happy about the people who were doing the engineered water. And that right. would be things like um, uh, deionized water, ionized water, and uh, um, electrolyzed water. Electrolyzed water is um, gaining, had gained a fair uh, foothold because you could use it. That's your electrolyzed water. Oh, fancy. Actually, this was this was an award. Uh, we were an early adopter, and they thought so much of us. They actually sent us a silver-plated one. 
Nice. Was, let's see. That was ionized. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, active ion. Electrostatic ion for the water, my positive, negative, whatever. It was all awesome, except that if you left water in it, it actually grew biofilm and you were wind up actually shooting more organic matter under the surface than what was there. You weren't. Wow. Oh. Things aren't always perfect when they first start. Uh, we'll idea. talk about that a little bit yeah. when we get into uh, some of the surfaces we're cleaning, too. Okay. Um, but uh, then the pandemic came along and disinfect, disinfect, disinfect. And it was yeah. like a gold mine for the oh, uh, yeah. chemical companies. We're beginning to see some traction again from the, uh, uh, especially the electrolyzed water. Okay. Electrolyzed water allows you to basically get one stream that is uh, hydrochloric, hydrochloric, hypochlorous acid, and the other one, which is uh, sodium hydroxide, which can be used for cleaning. Which is really just kind of like lye like soap, isn't it? Like well, it's, it's lye, and and what you're doing it is it, lye. It, yeah, it's lye. No lie. It's lie. Yeah. No lie. It's lye. All right. But it, it, with the electrolyzed water, or and with the other things you see, where they say. Uh, this is soap free and we haven't used soap in this industry in 50 years. So don't tell me about that, but detergent free, what okay. they're doing is they're using alkalinity to mix with the soils and especially the grease, whatever kind it is that's on the surface to create soap, basically mm -hmm. saponification. And then that's, what's doing the cleaning It's the, uh, they're basically creating soap on the surface. Bruce, we had a guest on, and I'm thinking it's probably over a year ago, a gentleman by the name of Marty Paris. He uh, is founder and CEO of a company called um, Annihilator, and, and they make split stream uh, machines that right. produce the hypochlorous acid and the sodium hydroxide. It's really cool. He explains how you just take a big tub and throw some salt and water in it and suck it into a machine that put some electricity to wow. it and making cleaning chemicals it's it's almost magic and it works and it will do a, a lot of your basic cleaning if you're okay. in uh, hold on i just need to make sure that everybody hears this bruce vance says it works so i don't want to hear any more like conversations or arguments about how it doesn't work. It's not real. But, but there are some caveats coming, Liz. There okay, is but uh, I want people to at least hear this part because you know how people just shut down. They're like, they have it in their head. But if Bruce says it works, all right, let's start from there. Okay, let's, let's look at right. a, a difference. Most of these things are geared to janitorial. Yes. If you're doing janitorial cleaning okay. and you're in there every day, you don't have to have the really big guns, heavy duty cleaners. If you're in our residential cleaning and they, uh, you know, you cleaned uh, on Monday and Tuesday morning, she dropped some egg on the floor and kept it there for um, until you came back two weeks later. Yeah. You're going to, you may need a little bit more elbow grease to get it out of there. Yeah. Now, when you're doing electrolyzed water, you can, you can, vary the strength of your chemical by how much salt you put into the mix. Okay. If you get too much, you're going to burn something because if you have too much OH in there, you've got a problem. So there's a little bit of a, a learning curve on this. Um, the zero res, which is the uh, a carpet cleaning uh, franchise that uses this, uh, this uh, uh, process, had a lot of trouble with browning carpet until they figured out exactly what the right mix was. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So, so, some of them are kind of dialed in based <laughs> on the whatever the saturation level is in the water. It gets to the point where you can only put in, you can put in all the salt you want and only so much of it, the water will only hold so much of it. They calibrate the machines that way. <laughs> and that's kind of the way Annihilator did it. But then the product that it was spitting out, you would dilute it and okay. cut it by, you know, two to one, five to one, 10 to one, depending upon what it was that you wanted to do. Excuse me. And what they're doing here, this is getting a little uh, technical. 
they have they are using a non buffered solution. That means that um, there's nothing there to keep the pH at a certain level as you dilute. Most of our cleaning agents, on the other hand, do are buffered. So that the idea is that as the as you dilute it down, your pH doesn't change that much. Okay. Think about the difference if you have if you pour water cold water into a glass and just let it sit out there, that temperature is going to go up. Yeah. But if you fill the guy, the glass with ice and then pour the cold water in, it's going to stay uh, cold a lot longer. Yeah. That's sort of buffered. It's okay. the glass like with the, the ice. ice. Would be the buffer. The, yeah. The ice would be a buffer in that case. Okay. Um, keep trying to find an, an, an easy way of describing that. Buffering agents. Yeah. So that was pretty good, Bruce. I, like I think I think that the uh, yes, the um, split stream works. It can be effective. It is uh, um, but it's not going to do everything we need to do. Okay. We're going to have the times we need a stronger degreaser. But for instance, we take uh, deionized water, which is just pure water, with a high quality microfiber, hospital grade microfiber. And this is all what Tom taught us. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, we can do like 70% of our cleaning with that. It will not clean, it will not do your uh, hard water film. It won't do your heavy buildups of grease, but it will do all that intermediate stuff. The advantage of the various empowered waters is that you make them in-house. If you're talking green, they are. there's no uh, petroleum, there's no carbon footprint in trucking it across the country. It's right there. You're making it. So you're, you've got a lot of advantages there. Will, it, will uh, uh, some of these, especially... The, the deionized water we use uh, be approved green? No, because it's the people who do the approval, green seal and such, charge a lot of money to get the approval. And if you're making it in your uh, uh, sink or on, you ain't going to pay $7,000 to have the thing approved green. Okay. But it, it really is quite. Uh... So this stuff is coming up and that's going to be an issue. Uh, I'll be curious to see how it plays out over the next few years. Uh, I think that it right now, like the anil air is, I think about $2,500. Uh, I think it's, I mean, they've got two machines out now. I mean, we have one and, uh, at the time they only had one and I think it retails for around 15,000. It's not a particularly cheap piece of equipment. Um, so it, yeah, go ahead. And they have a lower end product. I say a lower end product, a smaller product that I think retails for around eight, maybe. Okay. So I yeah. saw, and they were just introducing that at uh, ISSA last year. Yeah. I've, I have looked at it. I, uh, it was outside of my price range. So, so I don't think we're going to see that machine, but we are going to see some things get smaller and uh, more price conscious. Uh, there are yeah, some small stuff. little things that you can get that will supposedly do the work for you for like, I, I, I want to say as little as a few hundred dollars. More, more people are coming out with the ozonated handheld type stuff that you can charge and they're relatively inexpensive. You might want to speak to that, Bruce, rather than a gadget like this, you're using uh, ozonated water. Right. Now, the last time I looked at it, I haven't been able to find it. <clears throat> largely because I've been tied up with other things at, uh, at ISSA. But uh, uh, the last time I saw it, it, they said that we had 20 minutes it was a sanitizing agent and 40 minutes it was a cleaner, which, meant you, which means you'd have to be running around recharging it all the time. Wow. Yeah. Now, I understand they have improved that, but I have not seen it, so I can't. Again, it's a, a fairly well-proven <clears throat> um, system. But for a, for a maid service, it didn't seem to be, uh, at that point, um, 
Uh, there's a, the there's a company called Tersano that has a technology and they call it stabilized ozonated water. And they've got some little trick that supposedly keeps the uh, free, uh, I guess, free oxygen level up there for, for a longer period of time, like days, maybe. Yeah, I had heard that that was out there. As I say, I have not seen it. Right. So I, I can't speak to it. But, so. but all of that's kind of kind of cool. But um, but what, 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 how does this play into our future, Bruce? Right. What, are you seeing, what are you seeing, you know, well, coming out of high care? I see a number of things. One is we're going to have to be more aware of what we're cleaning. Okay. Um, Talk to us about that. What do you mean? Although, you know, there's there's the number of surfaces that are out there are just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, we've got stone, which, you know, the marketers like to talk about the fastest way to cash for the cleaner. That's the fastest way from cash. Um, and when I do the class, I like to talk about, I'm going to show you how to, how you can make a $10,000 mistake in less than two minutes. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Okay, Bruce, I have a story for you that you will like that goes right along with your story, I think. Um, one year, so my birthday is March 31st. Tom's is the very next day. And oh, wow. So, Alonzo Adams is the one after that. That's right. And Alonzo's is the very next day after and that. Aja Holidays is two days after that. Who says Aja's is on the third? On the fourth. Oh, on the fourth. All right. So a lot of people having birthdays right around that time period. So um, one day, one of my employees had called me and said, Hey, Liz, I know that it was just your birthday. And I hate to have to tell you this. Um, but we dumped over a bucket of vinegar on our clients, our clients marble entrance. Um, hey, Liz, can you come look at it? It looks kind of scary. Well, I was not happy. I was nervous until I realized that yesterday was my birthday. And today is April Fool's Day. It's not only Tom Stewart's birthday. Ooh. And it was April Fool's Day. <laughs> and I, I was never so happy to have someone play a prank on me. That was the best prank ever. <laughs> but they were trained so they understood the chemistry yeah. and the surfaces. and Of course. Cool. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but I thought Bruce would like that. It was just a prank in my case, Bruce. They, 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 they take the training you provide and use it against you. Yes, they did. <laughs> Uh-oh, you're muted, Bruce. You're muted, Bruce. I Sorry, I had a cough. Uh, and <laughs> years ago, we had we did we never had these kinds of finishes to deal with. You know, nobody yeah. had marble floors. But we had one client that did, and we cleaned it with something we thought was going to be safe, and we burned the floor. Twenty thousand dollars later, we wow. learned. That's when I started going. Hark! I need to know what I'm doing. <laughs> and that was back before inflation. That was back when twenty thousand dollars was a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, yeah. A, a big clean was $75, uh, you oh. know, for a 4,000 square foot house. Oh, wow. wow. So, uh, you know, these things are, we have to understand. You should let you bring that up again. It always brings the mood down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you, you, you know, if you know what you're doing, you don't do that. And that's the thing that's critical. We're finding that the installers don't know really how to clean stuff. How many times do an, an installer, you've got a granite countertop and the installer says, use Dawn. And how many times have you gone in and rubbed your hand over the countertop and it all feels gritty? That's so, because there's things in the... This, Bruce, huh? this was one of my favorite things that you taught me at the HCT course <clears> in <throat> Seattle years ago, because that was making me insane. There would be the, a counter at a client's home and it would, I would tell them, what the heck, you guys, you got to rinse these counters. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Feel this. You can feel the powder on here. You guys aren't rinsing this well. You need to do a better job. When you're done, you need to, you know, buff it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's this, there are things, there's chelating agents in the, uh, 
uh, the dish soap that uh, attacked the counter. Is it only in dish soap, only in Dawn, Bruce? No, no. Most of your uh, keeling agents make uh, detergents more effective by softening the water effectively. Yeah. It's not quite that simple, but that's that's close enough. Okay. And so most detergents have chelating agents in them because it makes them more efficient. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you have one that is stone specific, it either has very specialized chelating agents or it doesn't have any. Okay. And they these things don't end up on SDS sheets, so it's very hard to know. Um, I mean, we happen to know that uh, uh, Shackley's Basic H does not have chelating agents because Somebody in our leads group who has a, a great big Shackley business also happens to be a uh, biochemist called their chief chemist and asked, yeah. <laughs> but that's the only way, you know, you know, Yeah. so I just say, use a, uh, uh, use a stone specific cleaner and a microfiber or, or water. Um, we're also seeing, you know, uh, six, seven years ago, everybody was, pushing natural surfaces, which mm -hmm. are notoriously hard to clean. Mm -hmm. um, now we're seeing a big move towards cleanable surfaces. Okay. The What's LVT. That? Well, you have the vinyls, for instance. Okay. And we have lo a luxury vinyl tile. And luxury vinyl tile originally came out and in five years went from zero to 20% uh, of the entire flooring market. It just exploded. Huh. Um, the laminates that we're now getting from uh, major players like Pergo, like Mohawk, like uh, Canolium and Shaw are pretty well waterproofed. Although I was a little disturbed that uh, uh, Shaw said uh, on their water, some of their waterproof flooring says, do not use water to clean it. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, what, what would they like you to use? Well, they have a product, of course, they would love you to use, but. Uh, I wonder uh, if it contains water. Of course it does. <laughs> <laughs> that was but, my sarcasm in play. <laughs> but I I, I, uh, I, had been on a uh, little focus group of uh, four of us on how do you clean this stuff after uh, uh, post-construction cleaning. And we never said anything about you don't use water. So I emailed Jim Manis, who is the uh, uh, their aftercare manager, said, Jim, what's your thinking on this? You know, we would normally use a flat mop with water or some kind of cleaner. She says, that's perfect. It's buckets and puddles we don't want. So, again, we have to keep up on what's really happening out there. For instance, vinyl, steam mop should be fine, right? Mm -hmm. I would think. No. Well, not on the seams? What they found was that the super uh, energized vapor can get down in between the seams on most of it, where it condenses, but it can't come back out now. Ah, and so they're having mold, mold problems. Yeah, that makes sense. So this is the thing where you've got to kind of keep up on you know what's happening. They put this stuff out there. They don't know what's going to happen with it until they get it out there. When they first came out with LVT, luxury vinyl tile, the original luxury vinyl tile, they uh, f suddenly realized it's a thermoplastic and it will, if it gets hot, it increases. Where am I? There I am. And so if it was in front of a uh, sliding glass door with a southern or western exposure in the south, it deformed. Wow which is why they came out with what they call SPC, which is stone vol uh, polycore, which is they put limestone in it, which gives it dimensional stability. <clears throat> but I was talking to one of the uh, aftercare people. I said, you got limestone in here? He said, yeah. I said, you know, one of the new green cleaners is uh, the hydrogen peroxide cleaners. He said, yeah. Yeah, I said, you know, they're all acid side, don't you? And he went, we never thought of that. <laughs> Oh, gosh. <clears throat> so as we go out, we have to know what we're doing and okay. we cannot necessarily rely on what the, uh, especially not what the uh, dealer is telling you. And stuff. Yeah. Oh, the dealers. Yeah. You follow the, follow the, anything that's written you want to follow. Cause that'll be, take care of your warranty. It'll relieve you of any kind <clears throat> of liability. 
Uh, yes. Um, I was at a um, uh, class that the American Hardwood Association put on, and the fellow walked out, the instructor, and he started with this. The number one enemy of the wood floor is the maid. And what they're telling us is that 50% or more of all warranty claims are maintenance. And they are no longer accepting responsibility for maintenance. And to give you an idea of the, va of the volume we're talking about, I was talking to one uh, uh, flooring inspector who as of October, this was right before the <laughs> pandemic, she had handled $85 million worth of claims and one of her compatriots had handled $125 million. Is this primarily like residential claims? Residential and commercial. Consume, okay. Well, I hope the majority of that was commercial. <clears throat> but you you can see the kinds of dollars we're talking about. Right. And so they're not they're basically putting us on notice that hey, if it's the maid, you need to go talk to the maid. Don't talk to us. And so these are insurance. This is like basically warranty claims from the manufacturer. And if that fails, you go back to your GL policy. But if you're the professional and you did something you weren't supposed to do, you may want to speak to that, Bruce. They're not going to help you either. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> a lot of people feel that they, if you have a liability policy, it covers everything Ooh. that goes wrong in the house. And I've had people correct me on um some of the facebook things saying oh no 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 everything that anything that goes wrong in the house is covered under your liability i've been involved in enough cases where somebody has come to me for help after the fact when i can't really help them anymore and they're going my insurance company won't pay off why because it covers an accident it doesn't cover stupidity so <clears throat> if you Nice, are walking nice. across Way the room. There, Bruce. <laughs> I don't tell somebody this when they're, you know, yeah. but I do in a class. Uh, you can say things to a group that you can't say to an individual, especially after they've made a mistake. Uh, but if you're walking across the room and you trip and the bottle of bleach goes flying and you have to replace a rug and a couch, that's covered under your liability insurance. But if one of your technicians or you saw on the internet that you can take bleach and get a spot out of the carpet, which you can not, I don't recommend it. You can on certain fibers, but not most. And you, they, your person goes and ends up with a big bleach spot. Uh, the insurance company is going to look at you and say, oh, that's under your care, custody, or control. It's not, not our problem. You're a professional. You're supposed to know what you're doing. And that is a big shock with people. I've, I, one case they had, uh, they wanted to get a wood floor really clean. They glugged the, uh, the cleaner a few extra times and went after the floor to clean it up real well and turned it into a, a white sticky mess because they started to dissolve the polyurethane. $1,800 clean. I saw another one. In a, this was in a school. Uh, in three months, the new cleaners who went in there uh, used a mop on the wood floors, did $18,000 worth of damage. Wow. And that and was the, a, these are, and these are damages that are come out of the company's pocket. No manufacturer, no insurance company is going to pay no, for that. No. Now you can get, um, uh, a rider that covers some of this stuff. A stupidity but, rider. Yeah, I, I, the one we have co is called willful damage. Okay. And it's not all that expensive, but you've got to find a true commercial insurance agent who understands this stuff. Because <clears throat> most of them have no clue what you're talking about. So we're going to have to be aware of what we're doing and, and keep up on what the changes are. So that we know, again, what we're doing. Well, how do you keep up on these changes, Bruce? Well, I, I would say go to surfaces, but they uh, people aren't going to go do that, and they wouldn't like you to. Uh, they, won't, they don't want uh, people just wandering through there. Uh, 
I, I suspect, Tom, uh, you're still doing a... Being, being a member of ARCSI yeah. is a really good place to start because there's a lot of information that's curated and distributed to their members. And Bruce, I mean, you actively take a lot of the knowledge and research and things that you learn, like break, you know, I don't call it breaking news, but the latest developments and you share that information. Oh, absolutely. RC who shares it with its members. And uh, cleaning business today is still in working. Yeah. Last I saw. Yeah. Cleaning business today is a resource that, uh, well, we'll, we'll publish. <clears throat> Bruce has, has written for uh, Cleaning Business Today, you know, over the last, you know, it's having its 10th year anniversary, April of uh, this year, if you can believe that. And, wow. Um, and Arcee is having its 20th year anniversary. Wow. This year. That seems wow. so fast to me. I digress. But uh, plugging into to Cleaning Business Today, plugging into ARCSI are two things you can do to at least you know, be exposed to a lot of the concepts that are, um, Bruce yeah, what's talking. coming up. What's the, what are the problems? What did we think was going to work? And it doesn't, um, Bruce, can I ask a, 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 a sure. couple of questions? I, I want to get in before, before the hour completely gets away from us. We were talking about microfiber wipers and, you know, we were an early adopter. We've been using microfiber cleaning towels for 20 years. And this yeah. was back when, it was really, you know, everybody was cleaning with cotton, terry cloth and, yeah. and other fabrics. And, you know, over the last several years, I guess you start seeing more research where people are concerned about the microfiber that's coming off and the wash that's getting into the environment. And they're getting like marine life that's got all this like microfiber building up in its system and um, I see some companies that are actually getting away from the multi-use microfiber wipers to like single-use disposable wipers. Is that a trend that you think we're going to going to going to see getting any momentum? I think we will some in the um, janitorial. I'm not sure we will as much in. I, I've met I've met two rather established and successful. Make that three. Well, two that are doing it, and the third one that is is considering it that have made that move. And there's a couple of things behind that. From a cost standpoint, it arguably it's a little more expensive on the surface. But a lot of these companies, since COVID, more and more companies are going to solo models where their technicians will just get up in the morning pick up their phone, log into their favorite, you know, software. And I've got one in mind, but we don't need to go there. Anyway, find out what homes are cleaning. They go out and they clean a couple of homes and they go home. And the one problem that you're always dealing with is rotating the, the, the towels that they're cleaning with. And when they're going with disposable, the cost of uh, multi-use microfiber is higher in a, you know, solo remote workforce model. When you... Right. Throw that extra layer in there, disposable really starts becoming a wash, no pun intended. Now, the, I think one of the questions would be, can it be as effective? Well, <clears throat> from a consumer standpoint, uh, the feedback I'm getting is their customers like the idea more because they know it's, 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 it's clean, that, that it hasn't been used in somebody else's house. And they don't have to worry about it being properly laundered in terms of right. efficacy and how well it removes soil. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, I mean, the, if you look at the uh, Perfect Cleans, they have uh, testing showing a 99.99% uh, removal of pathogens in general, and up to up to 99.9999 on some. Yeah, so and we've we, we've done studies with with ATP. You you mentioned some of that earlier, and the higher end microfiber definitely does a better job of removing soil. Right, <clears throat> and that is uh, that gets up to the level of of uh, disinfection in terms of removing it. And so. um, the, the the other question is a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here, obviously. We think it's important, you know, because we in the industry, study, yeah. But we are in the minority, and you know, the uh -huh. general industry. I know that you're 
you're you're kind of kind of been spearheading this for for years, Bruce. And you know, you've had 500 companies take uh, HCT certification. That's awesome. But you know, there's a lot more. Yeah, I mean, that's oh, still man. it's still a, a small slice of the yeah. larger market, and consumers don't seem to really yet grab this um do you think that some point there's i mean with with everything that, that that you're doing the body of of science that's building that there will be some type of regulation coming in play where you know the government will either state or maybe even at a federal level start getting a little more active and making sure that professional cleaning companies are doing it in a responsible way i don't know i do know that a number of states now require a pesticide license to administer disinfectants. Okay. So that's one step there. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be difficult because everybody has their favorite way of cleaning. Uh, grandma did it this way. I mean, the reason we have, we, we're cleaning, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, hardwood floors with vinegar and water is because grandma had used soap to clean her floors, um, especially her linoleum, and vinegar rinsed the residue that was off. So she said, vinegar gets it squeaky clean. Uh... And when they used, when they came in with polyurethane, they used the oil soaps, uh, and if they had to go back and do any kind of repair to the finish, it wouldn't stick because of the oil soaps. They just said, oh, I don't know, use vinegar and water. It's, it's like uh, Liz's grandmother cutting the ends off the ham. Exactly, exactly. Uh, it made sense 70 years ago. It doesn't make sense now. And we're going to have, we're still going to have clients who want to uh, use all natural products, which they think are, are uh, healthy. We had a very interesting experience in one class. Uh, somebody wanted to, was using, uh, in fact, a number of people in the class were using thieves oil, which is something that a lot of the independents love. It's natural. It's safe. It's wonderful. And we pulled, and they said, could we look at an SDS sheet for it? So we pulled the SDS sheet. And yes, it was pretty, not, not a big deal for people. And that said, do not allow to get in waterways. Do not allow to get into... Uh, 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 sewers do not allow it extremely toxic to uh, aquatic life so it's like oh I thought this was just safe and natural and wonderful so <clears throat> which which is, I guess if you really break that down it's almost impossible to use that in a residential setting well it's yeah, it's it's uh, yeah. You have to be more careful of it than you think, and we see this all the time. And I don't know what it's going to take for sure to get around that. I do know that we're going to have to be careful with air quality. Um, you know, good vacuums, vacuum. That's becoming much more important, and people are beginning to think more about air quality. We're going to have to be careful about fumes coming off now. Right now, people think about uh, people are geared to think about the uh, volatile organic compounds, by which they're thinking of these horrible petroleum things. But when you take the top off a bottle of vinegar, you smell it instantly, right? Mm -hmm. You're smelling volatile organic compounds in that case. In fact, uh, Green Seal probably would not approve uh, vinegar because it has too high a, a VOC content and too low a, a pH. So. <clears throat> As we are, you know, moving forward, I think there's going to be increasing interest in trying to get this stuff right and trying to get so we're not damaging products, especially for the cleaning industry, because we are we are having more responsibility. And uh, you know, I know that a, that a lot of the individual cleaners. Get, have a buy because when they destroy something, they don't have enough money to their sue proof. But uh, which yeah. has ha happened, by the way, in both of the cases I talked earlier about the wood floors. Uh, 
But I think that we need to be in it as an industry. We need to be thinking about uh, what's really going on here. What we're, are, what we're doing uh, really being that helpful? Are we getting it clean? And again, you know, how do we tell it's clean? And we now have some tools to do that. As you, as an industry matures, it tends to go from being able to determine success from a subjective method, looks clean, or as uh, when I first got involved in uh, carpet cleaning and, and restoration came part along with that, you felt you know the wall feels dry. Today, you you uh, uh, if you did that, you'd end up in court. <clears throat> because you uh, have mold growing. So we are now moving in this industry from subjective to objective, where we can actually determine, is this system working? And I think that is the, the, what we're go going to have to hope is the direction that we go more and more, because that's really when we become professionals and not just a drudge or not just the lady who does for um, Mrs. Jones. And as we talk to our clients, we want to become more of a consultant for them. I remember walking through a house and it was a new house and I'm, um, we had done the post-construction cleaning on it. And I walked through with a couple, I said, now this is such and such a product, a uh, surface. You need to do this to clean that. You need to do this to clean that. You need, she said, do you do ongoing cleaning? I said, yes. Said so good. We start basically, you know. Okay. You know, I, I I think that it is changing, and a lot of times change starts slowly before it happens quickly. And there's a lot of things that are happening within the industry that are all positive. You know, I see a lot of cleaning companies that are growing from a from a revenue and from a, from a bottom line profit standpoint. Companies are scaling at levels that you know even five years ago you would have a hard time imagining and certainly on the 20th year anniversary of arxy when you would get together and you know it was a big deal if you're a million dollar company and now oh, yeah. you know it's you know i saw some numbers and and just about half of the companies that are on made central are over a million dollars a year and an impressive number of them are two or more and it's you know it's a lot of things are happening. There's better training. More companies are bringing in professional management techniques. The technology mm -hmm. is enabling a lot of this. There's even yeah. private equity that's coming into the residential cleaning space. And you couldn't even imagine that five years ago. All of that is just raising the stakes. The more you have, the more you have to lose. And the more important it is that you incorporate professional cleaning <clears throat> techniques yes. in the in the the, the 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 you know issues that Bruce is bringing forward here, all of that's going to force it to happen more quickly moving forward. You're going to see a lot more happening in the next ten years in this regard than what we saw in the last time. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think we're going to have. Uh, I think we're going to have better cleaning. I think we're going to have better uh, understanding of what it is we're trying to do. I mean, we saw that just in the pandemic. Yeah. The advice we got in the beginning and uh, that, that wonderful article in the Atlantic called uh, that uh, Derek Thompson run, uh, wrote, um, what was it? It was uh, hygiene theater. That what we were doing really was just the, uh, theatrical, not accomplishing anything. We were it basically it was just just for show. Yeah. We are right at the top of the hour, but before we go, Bruce, is there anything that you would like to, to share with the audience? Do you have any HCT classes coming up? Anything that, that we need to know about that would uh, be useful in this regard? Well, HCT class we have coming up. Let me get make sure I've got the dates. We have a Zoom class um, in February on the 9th and 10th. And if I want to sign up for that, how do I do it? Uh, go to ARCSI, A-R-C-S-I, and uh, go to events, and it will have HCT, and you can sign up for it there. All right. So for everybody, that's ARCSI.org, I think. And okay. go to events, look for, I think it, they actually have it listed as HCT. Yeah. Um, 
versus yeah, I think you can also find you, in the menu people. in the in the here. I'll share my screen real quick. Oh, that's good. And, and there'll also be one in April. But there, if you go there, they'll have a list of. There we go. Can you see that? Need yeah, to... it's a little, it's little, but I can even see it on my laptop. Okay, so if you go to um, events, and I did that, it will bring you to this page. Let me let me back up. And we'll we'll take it from the top. Okay. You go to rxc.org, it'll bring you here. I go to education and events. I go down here and click on live and virtual uh, education and training. And here you go. The IICRC HCT certification program. I'm going to click on that and I'm going to drop this in chat. Ah, okay, perfect. great. And um, you got something else going on, Bruce? Uh, we'll have one in April in uh same from you can go to the same place and that is 13 and 14. ah you've got it right there good yep. is that also a, a zoom meeting that's a virtual yes the next uh, we will be doing an in-person class in vegas at the show okay that's all the way in october right yeah so, so i don't even think they're taking registrations for that yet no no, and if somebody has, uh, you know, wants a in-person class for uh, a private, we can arrange that too. We and how would that. I do that? Um, you can call our office here at uh, 919-967-7592. And that will uh, that'll get, get to me and I'll... Uh, 919-967-7592. 967 yes. Okay. There we go. No. Did you put his, no. So that's Bruce's number. So yeah. don't be just distributing that to all your crazy friends. Right. Yeah. That's our office number. Uh, <laughs> oh, well then go ahead and distribute it to all your, your crazy, crazy friends. friends. Uh, Especially they'll... if they're dirty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they need their home clean in Raleigh. Yeah. yeah. yeah or uh, Chapel Hill or Pittsburgh, yes. Okay, uh, so uh, any we we're 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 at the top of the hour, Bruce. Any any closing thoughts? I think we've got an exciting time to come. I see a, there's been a lot of change in the last five years. Uh, and I think some of these uh, uh, trends are gonna continue. And I'm not sure where we're going to be in five years, but I w we would have ha had a hard time when we started this thing. In fact, even when we started the HCT, what's that now? 12 years ago? Well, we started it probably wow. 15 years ago. Wow. Um, envisioning what we have now and what we would yeah, have to be kidding. teaching. And, you know, I think in five years, we'll all be making more money. I yeah. certainly hope so. It's an opportunity here for us. Yes. Thank I you, think, Bruce. I think the people who are professional will do well. Yeah. All right. Thank you, sir. Great. Thank you so much, Bruce. Talk soon. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. We'll be back next Bye -bye. Wednesday, 5 o'clock Eastern. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all. -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.